Hello all, I hope that uh, this message finds you well. Uh, I'm thankful to uh, be able to continue uh, to stay connected to you in this way and I hope that uh, these prayers and, and these stories have been helpful and beneficial to you. I hope that where you are at, uh, that you are filled with peace and joy, even as we continue to move through this holy week uh, to toward the, the celebration of the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray that wherever you are at, you are safe and you are full of health. I'm going to go ahead and open with the prayer that we have been sharing from Psalm 91, and then we are going to do uh, the third edition of Wise Words from Peter Lightheart. I think this third story uh, is, is a really good one. I really enjoy it. But, but let's go ahead and begin with our prayer from Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night nor the arrow that flies by day nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you, no plague come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder. The young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Amen. So today, now we are looking at chapter 3 of the book Wise Words by Peter Lightheart. And I'm going to read uh, this story to you. Uh, this story is entitled, The Bleeding Tree. Once upon a time, an oak tree stood on a hill overlooking a quiet valley. The tree was tall for his age and very strong. His long branches spread in every direction, and his leaves sparkled like emeralds in the sunlight. Where his branches met his thick trunk, Robins and gray squirrels built their nests. On the other side of the valley was a temple of unearthly beauty. It was so wondrous a temple that the tree often doubted that men could have built it. It must have fallen from the sky. Every morning and evening a song drifted from the temple, a song so pure it filled the heart with a painful joy. The tree gazed each day at the temple of unearthly beauty and listened to the song that filled the heart with a painful joy. He was saddened when night fell, hiding the temple in darkness, and he was delighted when the morning sunlight unveiled the temple anew. He felt lonely in the evening when the song faded to silence, and he thrilled when it began again each day at daybreak and sunset. He dreamed of a world where there would be no night and where the song would never end. He wanted to gaze and listen forever. 
But the more the tree looked at the temple and the more he listened to the song, the more he knew he would never be content with looking and listening, even if he could look and listen for all eternity. Deep in his heart, he did not want to gaze at the temple. He wanted to become the temple, to surround the hushed space of the inner sanctuary where even children spoke in whispers. Deep in his heart, he did not want to listen to the song. He wanted to become the song, to spread himself over the valley like a blanket of music softer than silence. Thinking these thoughts made the tree sadder still. For he was a tree, and he knew he would never be a temple of unearthly beauty or a song that filled the heart with a painful joy. His branches were too twisted, his bark too rough, the voice of the wind through his leaves too harsh and hollow. So for many years the tree stood on his hill, gazing and listening. His heart grew sadder with each passing year. In what seemed like a sh very short time, he was no longer a young tree. And still he wished nothing more than to become the temple of unearthly beauty and to be the song that filled the heart with a painful joy. One night, the temple hill was lighted as if it were day. An orange glow flickered against the black sky, growing brighter, then nearly disappearing. Through the cool night air, the tree heard a distant voice cry, Fire! When the sun rose the next morning, the valley was utterly still. The mockingbirds refused to sing. No squirrels scampered, chattering through the treetops. Worst of all, where the temple had been, there was only a smoking black ruin. Men circled the ruins with their hands thrust deep in their pockets, their heads bowed. Women sat on the grass with their faces in their hands. The tree was sickened to see what had happened to the temple. Knowing he could no longer gaze at the temple or listen to its song, he felt more empty and alone than ever. For several days, the men circled the ruins and the women sat on the grass. Then one day, the men stopped circling to huddle together, and the women drew their faces from their hands and looked up. The men talked and nodded and pointed excitedly. Smiles crossed the women's faces. Across the valley, the tree watched with growing wonderment. The next day, he watched the men and women work in the midst of the black ruins, knocking over the remaining walls and picking up charred pieces of the temple's furniture. In a few days, the ruin was gone. All that remained of the temple was a black stain on the green hillside. Then the men slung belts filled with shining tools across their shoulders and started down the hill toward the forest where the tree stood watching. They disappeared into the valley and then reappeared near the tree. Soon they were circling the trees with their hands in their pockets. The tree was startled by a shout that came from somewhere near his trunk. This one looks ready! A man cried to his friends. In a moment, the tree was surrounded, and the men were running their hands up and down his bark. It tickled, but the tree was afraid to laugh. The men talked and nodded. Then all but one ran back into the forest. The remaining man took a stick with a bright metal head from his belt, stamped his feet, twisted his back away from the tree, and swung the stick. The blow shook the tree from his topmost branches down to his roots. In shock and surprise, he cried out, but no one seemed to hear. He felt a stinging pain low on his trunk as the shining tool made another gaping wound, then another. Strips of bark peeled away like the skin of an apple. The tree felt sap flowing from his wound. Look at this, the man cried. This sap looks red, like blood. 
I've never seen anything like this before. It's a bleeding tree. The other men came closer and circled the tree with their hands in their pockets, nodded, and then scampered back to their hiding places in the forest. The man swung his shining tool again and again. After a while, he became tired, and another man took the stick and began swinging it on the other side of the trunk. The tree shuddered in agony with each blow. He felt himself weakening as his trunk was slowly cut off from his roots. All the men took turns striking the tree with the shining tool. Finally, the tree could no longer stand and began to sway. The men cried out and ran deeper into the forest as the tree, losing all strength, fell to the ground with a thunderous crash. No use trying to get up, the tree thought. Perhaps if I lie here, they will leave me alone and go away. Before he had finished that thought, the men had come out of the forest, each carrying a shiny tool of his own. They pushed their way through the branches toward the trunk and swung their tools against the branches. One by one, branches were torn from the trunk. At each branch, red sap dripped onto the ground. The man who had first swung his shining tool against the tree cut off a thick branch. This is good, strong wood, he shouted to his friends. We could probably use this branch in the organ. To the tree, it sounded as if the man was shouting from the far end of a long tunnel. From the tree's higher branches, a voice answered. These smaller branches are strong too. We can make pipes and flutes and violins from these. In no time, the tree's branches had all been removed. The tree no longer felt pain, only a numbness like death. Perhaps they wanted only the branches, he thought. Now they will leave me alone and let me die in peace. No sooner had he finished that thought than he felt strong hands tying ropes to his trunk. It seemed to be happening to someone else, the tree thought. His mind drifted into a kind of sleep. He was jerked awake as the men bowed, bowed their backs to pull his branchless trunk down into the valley. They pulled again and again. Finally, the tree felt himself rolling, rolling down the hill faster and faster. The men scattered in all directions, picked up their tools, and came running to catch up. At the bottom of the hill, the tree came to a rest. Still dizzy from rolling, he heard the pounding of feet as the men bounded down the hill after him. Then they took hold of the ropes and pulled him toward a long house without walls that stood beside the river that flowed through the valley. Grunting and groaning, the men pulled what was left of the tree into the longhouse and lifted him over a deep pit. Looking up, the tree saw two men holding a long metal strip covered with sharp teeth. He was too weak to move and could only watch in terror as the men pulled the toothed metal back and forth across his trunk it cut into his trunk as the teeth of a wolf tear a helpless sheep. Dust flew in all directions. The tree tried to cry out, to stand up, to roll off the table, but it was no use. Crying out with a loud voice, he fainted, or perhaps died. The tree knew nothing of what happened next. After his trunk was sawn into boards, the boards were cut and trimmed, Corners were squared, and the boards were sanded smooth. Then they were polished to a golden shine. Small branches were cut, hollowed out, and carved into pipes and flutes. Larger branches were cut, bent, carved, and polished to make other instruments. The largest branches were cut into boards for an organ. The tree never knew how long he had slept, or fainted, or died, or whatever it was that had happened to him. When he first awoke, he did not know where he was. After the pain he had endured, he was amazed to find himself alive. Slanting rays of morning sunlight changed into a rainbow by stained glass windows filled the air. Everywhere he looked, 
His eyes were dazzled by the sights. In front of him, the tree saw a wooden pillar carved with great cunning, and the tree recognized it as one of his friends from the forest. Far below him, men, women, and children sat in restless silence, waiting for something or someone. Then there was music, played softly at first, then louder and louder. The tree recognized the flutes, violins, and organ as his own branches. The people began to sing. And then the tree knew. He had been made into the inner wall of a new temple of unearthly beauty, and that his branches had become a song so pure it filled the heart with a painful joy. The moral of this story is this. My son, do not reject the discipline of the Lord or loathe his reproof. For whom the Lord loves, he reproves, even as a father, the son in whom he delights. Proverbs 3, verses 11 and 12. Please know that I continue to pray for each and every one of you. God bless you all.